Well, I feel like I've been introduced quite a few times today. So I will just say hi again. I'm Ellen Cheek for the last 14, almost 15 years. Um, thanks to the best legal services developer in the nation, Sarah Halsell. I've been funded by the Department of Elder Affairs um, and I've been the senior staff attorney at the Florida Senior Legal Helpline. And the helpline is kind of unique. We are a, a legal services uh, delivery, part of the legal services delivery system. I'm housed, embedded, as they say, at um, Bay Area Legal Services in Tampa. But we do the entire state by phone. And that's um, what we do is we're all attorneys uh, at the Senior Legal Helpline. It's just like a regular appointment. It's like an appointment if you would come to the office, except it occurs over the phone. So as I started to say with the risk detector, we do all the regular screening and conflict checks. We check for eligibility. And um, then you are scheduled an appointment with an attorney at a specific time. In that role, I've spoken to literally thousands of Florida seniors, um, generally low-income seniors, and within 300% of the federal poverty level, level. And at this point, while we are a general uh, civil legal, we have a general civil legal services practice, I specialize pretty much in abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And unfortunately, there's a real need for that, for that specialty. But this, as we have heard all day long, is a good state to specialize in abuse, neglect, and exploitation. I think there's a lot of positive things happening here. And I'm going to talk about some of them right now, sort of a reprisal of some of the good news we've heard today. Um, let's see. There we go. We've got the statutes. You've heard about them all day. Uh, 825.103, the financial exploitation of a vulnerable adult. We now all know this is a crime in Florida. 825.1035, the injunction for protection against financial exploitation of a vulnerable adult. Yay. Chapter 415 is the Florida statute that provides um, for the whole scheme of adult protective services in the state. And notably provides for a statewide abuse hotline and a mandatory reporting requirement. There are lots of other statutes which impact seniors and senior consumers, but for our purposes today, I think these are three really notable statutes and they're really uh, part of the good news. Ah. And I can't emphasize enough. For me, it's like being a groupie at a rock concert today. This is a phenomenal group, and what we've learned today is, is terrific, and it's got a lot to do with the groups up here. We've got the leadership and support for fighting abuse, neglect, and exploitation like very few states in the union. Um, General Moody and the AG Senior Protection Team are really serious. Um, we heard earlier from Nick Cox. He and I have been um, traveling to uh, talk with uh, sheriffs and state attorneys. We've hit three counties so far. We have 64 to go, no big deal. <laughs> but it's all about making what we think are really critical connections and this is all at the initiative and with the support of the Florida Attorney General. Um, Florida state legislators, uh, the support we've had, you heard, I don't know if she's still here, from Kathleen Pasadomo and uh, Representative Colleen Burton. Extraordinary. That's how we got these first in the nation statutes right here. It's because they're pretty tireless and absolutely dedicated. Prosecutors and civil elder law attorneys, that last panel was terrific. I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind at how much promise there is with the um, criminal and civil elder law bar. Law enforcement, we're working with them through the uh, AG senior protection team. And um, as you'll see as I go on, 
uh, we, I look forward to working with them a lot more in, in the next two years. The Florida Department of Elder Affairs and the Legal Services Developer, Sarah really is like the gold standard. Legal service, as the legal services developer, she developed my job. She developed the Florida Senior Legal Helpline, and she has supported me with every cockamamie idea I've come up with over the years, including the um, elder law risk detector that we're so excited about. Um, the Florida Department of Children and Families, Adult Protective Services, again, uh, as you're gonna see in a minute, they're, they're my new best friends, and I'm, I'm delighted to be working with them. And the network of aging service professionals, researchers, and the press, um, what press we got, uh, it's really quite a lineup and says so many good things for the future. However, <laughs> in my humble opinion, Simply stated, there is a lack of legal action on elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation in the state of Florida. The number of prosecuted cases is extremely small relative to the volume of complaints called into the abuse hotline. And the, the number of complaints called into the abuse hotline, we know is severely underreported. Also, as Sarah began to say, there are lots of civil legal remedies which are available, but they're not necessarily accessed or provided, again, because of resource issues. Whoop. So when we started to wonder, uh, did I skip one? Let's see. Yeah. So we think a lot about this, a lot about this. And we were wondering, with a lineup like this, with su the support we've got and with the statutes we've got and with the setup we've got here in Florida, why doesn't it work better? Why do we have so many cases falling through the cracks? And we started by looking at, we, we looked at several different places. And um, I'm going to discuss some of them. So we started with the abuse hotline. And I want to say right off the bat, Florida's Adult Protective Services is remarkable. They deal with a stunning volume of the saddest, most pitiful, sometimes disgusting cases. And they do such a good job of what the statute says they're supposed to do. The trouble is, what they do is not necessarily what we think they do or what we think they should do. And that's almost a design problem. We have a situation where we're in a mandatory reporting state, which is a good thing. It's a very good thing, and that means everybody who has a credible suspicion of abuse, neglect, or exploitation is supposed to report it. Oftentimes, the victims call in themselves. This is really, really important. And the APS case handlers do a remarkable job. But not all cases are, are eligible for APS intervention. And by the way, Notice I didn't say the elder abuse hotline, which I always used to say, because I've just, it's been explained to me that it's not just the elder abuse hotline. That incredible hotline handles, whoa, not only uh, folks 18 and, and older, uh, the bailiwick of uh, adult protective services, but also handles all the child abuse cases, okay? That's an overwhelming workload in a state like Florida. It also means that the case handlers are not necessarily um, specifically trained on adult protective service issues. It's a, it's a much more general thing. So not all cases are eligible for APS intervention. 
That's right. Chapter 415 is pretty specific. Um, there are only certain predators, for example, uh, that, uh, how can I say this? The cases, the predators have to have a certain relationship to the, to the victim, a uh, relative, a uh, household member, or a caregiver. Um, people have to be uh, a certain age. People have to be alive. The victim has to be alive. And that might sound obvious, but it's not always obvious because some of the victims have, have died. Um, and why is that? Well, it's because Chapter 415 makes APS's mission very clear. It's to prevent immediate harm or imminent, imminent harm to a vulnerable adult. Okay? So what happens to the others? What happens to the cases where the predator is not in the proper relationship or um, uh, perhaps the, the crime, if you will, has already occurred, the money is already gone. Uh, it's not a question of preventing so much uh, being able to deploy protective services. It's already happened. What happens there? Well, the statute provides for uh, referrals, for referrals to law enforcement, for referrals to the state attorney, and referrals to, to civil legal services. And they, that happens, but we don't know that it happens consistently, and we don't know that it happens in a form that's compelling enough for like a busy state attorney's office or a busy law enforcement office to really recognize how compelling the case is. Enter the risk detector, oh, an outcome. Um, 415 also says that uh, reports are supposed to go back and forth on the outcome of referrals. We know for a fact that doesn't always happen. And what does that mean? It means we don't have data. You know, we don't know, we don't know the results. So, in thinking a lot about what we could do to assist, um, assist how we could make this better, how we could use the existing framework, um, and, and how we could make it a whole lot better, we started to think about technology. Um, Sarah Halsell and I and several others were already working on the civil elder risk detector, and we wondered if that couldn't be tweaked for criminal applications as well. And we thought about it, and we talked about it, and we got very excited about it. And then, as often happens when you think about something so much that everything seems relevant to it, we noticed um, a grant opportunity from the U.S. Department of Justice, the Off Office of Victims of Crime. And the title of this was, um, technological enhancements to a state elder abuse hotline. We kind of looked at each other and said, it's what we're talking about. Isn't that what we're talking about? Isn't that exactly what we're talking about? So we, we applied. Um, a team of three of us at Bay Area Legal Services, uh, my, my Boss of 14 years, Mary Haberland, a very gifted legal services attorney with a deep background in domestic violence work and, and a really good partner for this, Tracy Cole, who's right there, who's our um, tech liaison, which is really, really important when I'm the other leg of this three-legged stool, and me. We applied, and a uh, little over a month ago, we learned that we were successful. We've gotten a two-year grant, um, it began October 1st. In the way of the federal government, they tell you on September 30th that, that it begins on, it's you, and it begins on October 1st. So effectively, especially if you're me, you're behind when you start. Um, but we're catching up, we're catching up. So let me tell you, it's a three-part project. 
And the whole point of this, the whole point of this is to get vulnerable adults to the legal services they need, whether it's civil legal services or whether it's to law enforcement or to a state attorney's um, attention. So the three-part project, uh, I'm gonna discuss each one, and I can do that right now, it'll be easier. So, part one, part one. This is actually a continuation of work we've already begun. Um, we thought it was really important, and we got quite a ways along. The federal money will allow us to roll this out statewide. So here's, here's what this is about. Sarah explained, um, we have a network of civil legal services programs throughout the state. And we have the senior legal helpline, and we give legal advice over the phone in all counties. But if we can't solve a problem in the course of several phone calls, if we can't solve a problem with advice and brief services, we want to make a referral for extended legal services. And we do that to one of our legal services partners. Florida is a very, very large and very diverse state. We have some areas with tremendous legal services programs that are well supported and very robust. And we have others that frankly are struggling from a resource point of view. So our goal is to place as many priority cases as possible, even where resources are limited. The federal government, the, the uh, Older Americans Act funding that Sarah talked about, it's called 3B, that's what people call it. Um, we try to target those programs and we want them to accept these high priority cases that involve abuse, neglect, and exploitation. <laughs> Well, as it says, the programs have limited funds in general, and they have Title III B funds are even more limited. So what we worked on, what we did was a modification to the case management system that every legal services program in Florida uses. And what it does is it like puts a spotlight on the cases that involve abuse, neglect, and exploitation. It highlights the priority cases. And let me explain why that's so important. Title III B, divorce, is not a priority case. If that's the service that's needed, that's not a priority case for one of these legal services programs. But if it's divorce because a spouse is being abused, that's a 3B priority. So the legal services the legal service that needs to be rendered, the legal problem code is still divorce, but we want to make sure that program knows it's divorce, but to prevent abuse or to stop abuse. Very important and a very important distinction. Similarly, um, probate is, uh, and, and uh, uh, real, real property work, not a Title III-B priority. But if someone has defrauded a senior out of their home with a quick claim deed, that's exploitation. And that's a 3B priority. So we reworked, I didn't do this, but somebody really, really smart about tech things did it. We have modified the case management system according to information we've given them so that in each of these cases, if there's an abuse, neglect, or exploitation component, a light will shine on it virtually. And it's the go ahead to that legal services program and says, you can use your 3B money on this one. That's okay. And it also includes an automatic report back function. Again, data. These are some of the many, many organizations we need to roll this out statewide and really make this happen. Um, I'll talk more about this if we have some time, but I wanna um, keep on picking up the pieces. So 
victims of abuse, neglect, and exploitation, whether a case is prosecuted or not, whether uh, adult protective services is able to provide services in the home or not, there are often a panoply, a vast range of other junk that just fall out, uh, collateral damage, if you will, that, that happens. Civil legal services can very often fix that. We can revoke powers of attorney. We can have new ones reissued. We can try to do something about, again, a fraudulent property conveyance. We can sometimes fix benefit screw-ups that, that the abuse or the exploitation impacted. Um, so many things. Unlawful detainer, that means if, if your abuser is still in your house and won't leave, there's a way to get rid of that person. There's a civil legal remedy for that, and we can help. Connecting with legal services, that's the function of the civil elder law risk detector. That's why we want to use it in the field, because a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand that we can help even after APS has been there, even if law enforcement won't take a report, there may be other things we can do to give very meaningful relief. That's where the civil elder law risk detector will help identify those cases and send them on. And then the, the, the uh, innovation we are literally thrilled about, in, and that is this idea to take the civil elder law risk detector, rewrite that script with the help of a lot of people I'm going to discuss in a minute, and make sure that when adult protective services case handlers, for example, get those calls, that there's a web based um, uh, tool. It's like the risk detector, only it's designed for, um, to make criminal referrals to law enforcement or to the state attorney's office. And it will do so with, again, a short, a concise report, but one with this graphic that indicates the level of risk and has enough substantive information for a busy state attorney or a busy law enforcement um, sheriff's office to take a quick look and say, yes, this is something that's worthy of further investigation. We better get to this. Now, I am not a criminal attorney. We're going to need a lot of help writing the script for the branch logic um, so the questions that are asked, and there aren't many of them, we have to do this with a short number of questions because we don't want to overload people who are already working so darn hard, um, but with a few questions that will help generate a report that would give law enforcement or a state attorney something really to work with. Um, and we're going to look to our friends in our criminal lawyer friends and prosecutors and attorney general's office and every other resource we can think of, not to mention Adult Protective Service, who has already been so uh, cooperative and, and so helpful. These, these scripts are going to really be written with the help of, of these people who will use them. APS, law enforcement, state attorneys, and the AG's senior protection team. Those, we hope, will be our script writers. So, the goal of all of this in this fight against abuse, neglect, and exploitation. We want to increase the number of referrals for civil legal services. We want to increase the acceptance level by civil legal services programs, and we want to increase the number of financial exploitation cases prosecuted, and finally, we want to collect the data so we can tell our story in a compelling way to legislators, policymakers, federal 
Older Americans Act funding sources, and everybody else who could possibly help with the fight against abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Oh, so I forgot. I, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the outreach tool. We're hoping to train, Sarah's going to be back in January to train the people who go out to the vulnerable adults to use this tool. Now, I, Mary and I and many others here did a lot of the brainstorming and the wordsmithing, but the fact is we do a lot of this. But Tracy Cole made this logic model um, required, by the way, for, for federal grants. But this is the way, and I, I'm a, I don't know whether you can see it, but this is, these are our goals, these are our objectives, and this is how we intend to accomplish this. Meet you back here in two years, and we'll tell you we tell you how we did. If nothing else, we want very badly to collect the data we don't have now so we can tell people where these cases are going and, um, and what, the, what the outcome is. I think it's going to help enormously with funding and with targeting resources where they're really needed. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.